Hello everyone, thank you for joining me. My name is Rachel Gray. I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Glasgow and I've spent the last three years working on measuring the Hubble constant using uh, dark standard sirens. In this talk, I'm going to give a brief overview of cosmology with standard sirens and the maths behind it, followed by a look at gravitational wave and electromagnetic selection effects, what they are and how they can best be accounted for. We'll then briefly look at uh, testing this method with mock data and then using it on real data from LIGO and Virgo's first and second observing ones to measure the Hubble constant for them. And then I will go on to discuss um, the complications that come from using this methodology um, and the immediate challenges that face us uh, before finally looking at when we might possibly have a competitive measurement of the Hubble constant from this method. So when you detect a gravitational wave merger, um, it gives you a sky localization and an estimate to the event's luminosity distance, uh, which if you combine with redshift information, you can use to measure the Hubble constant. If you're lucky enough to detect an EM counterpart um, with the event, as happened with the binary neutron star GW 170817, you can use this to um, identify the host galaxy of the merger and use that galaxy's redshift for the measurement. If, on the other hand, you don't detect an EM counterpart, as is the case for the majority of events which we have detected so far, um, it is instead possible to use galaxy catalogues provide you with all of the possible um, redshifts of potential host galaxies and do a sort of statistical analysis um, over all of these to infer information about the Hubble constant. I suspect Bernard Schutz will have already mentioned this um, in his talk as this idea was first proposed by him. <laughs> now obviously this is um, a very simplified view um, two immediate things which spring to mind which also need to be addressed are one correcting for gravitational wave selection effects which is the fact that our gravitational wave detectors have finite sensitivity and then we also need to compensate for galaxy catalog incompleteness um, the fact that our galaxy catalogs are not complete and therefore might not even contain the real host galaxy um, of the event but this area in particular is what I have been focusing on. Um, and this is what I'll be talking about today, uh, where the term dark standard siren just simply means we have not detected an EM counterpart. And so we are going to use this method instead. So let's look at a bit of the maths. Uh, this here is the equation for the posterior on the Hubble constant, given a set of NDET uh, detected gravitational wave events. So XGW is our gravitational wave data, and DGW simply means that this data passed some threshold in order to be deemed detected. Looking at the right-hand side of the equation, we have uh, P of H0, which is simply our prior on the Hubble constant, uh, this term here is a rates term. Um, in general, the rate of events that you detect can give you information about the Hubble constant, but I'm not going to go into detail about that. Um, instead, I will be focusing on the final term here, which is the contribution from a single gravitational wave event. And you can see that when you have multiple gravitational wave events, uh, you multiply them together, and that is how you build up your constraint on the Hubble constant and the real power of this method is when you have multiple events. So looking a little bit closer at this term, if you expand uh, the likelihood for a single event, um, you get these three terms here. The first one of which is probability of detection given this gravitational wave data. But we've already said that we're specifically looking at uh, gravitational wave detections, which means the data has already passed some threshold. So this term becomes one by definition. Um, that means the numerator just becomes um, the likelihood on the gravitational wave data. And then we have this term here, uh, which is probability of detection. Um, and that is exactly where our gravitational wave selection effects come from. 
So what are gravitational wave selection effects? Essentially, our detectors um, are finite in their sensitivity. Uh, we are more likely to detect things which are nearby, and we are more likely to detect things which are loud, uh, where loud tends to correlate with events that are more massive or are uh, face-on, inclined face-on. This figure here um, shows the probability of detection for binary neutron stars um, as a function of luminosity distance for an O2-like sensitivity gravitational wave detector network. Um, you can see it drops from 1 to 0 over about 200 megaparsecs. Um, I will come back to the fact that um, it looks like one curve, but is actually uh, several curves and does in fact depend on the Hubble constant. That is because in order to calculate um, the probability of detection, you have to marginalize over all possible sort of gravitational wave data and then basically ask um, how, how much, how many of these events pass the threshold to be counted as detected. Um, and this involves knowing um, things about the population that you're observing. So um, for binary neutron stars, this would be like the binary neutron star mass distribution, um, and then also their distribution in redshift um, inclinations, polarizations, and all of those things uh, need to be marginalized over. But that's simple enough for the time being, um, and I will come back to it later. The other interesting question is, of course, what if the host galaxy is not in the catalogue? This figure here is from uh, the Glade paper. Um, Glade is a composite catalogue made up of uh, lots of different surveys and essentially was put together in order to have a sort of full sky covered um, catalogue for use with, for analysing gravitational wave data with. Um, this is mostly just here as an example. Uh, look at the green curve. This is B-band completeness um, as a function of luminosity distance. And essentially the important thing to note is that it drops off with distance. The higher the distance, the less complete your catalog is, which means the less likely you are to have a host galaxy uh, inside it. So how do we actually account for this? in our method. Well, essentially, we come back to this term here, the likelihood for an individual event, and we marginalize it over this term, little g, um, which can take two values, big G corresponding to in the galaxy catalog, and uh, g bar corresponding to not in the galaxy catalog. So we've now got four different terms. Um, to break it down a little bit more clearly, hopefully, uh, these two terms here essentially read as what is the probability that the host galaxy is inside the catalog given that you've detected um, a gravitational wave? Uh, or conversely, what's the probability that it's not in the catalog? Um, these two terms are probabilities. They have to add up to one because the host galaxy has to be somewhere. And how we determine them uh, requires some assumptions about the universe that we live in. So there's an assumption of um, redshift prior, which one would usually take to be uniform and co-moving volume. Uh, there's also an assumption about the luminosity distribution of galaxies, um, say some choice of Schechter function. If you then are able, you can then model the completeness of the catalog uh, using an apparent magnitude threshold um, and basically take that as the limit for what is the, uh, deemed in the catalog or out of the catalog. So it's also uh, worth noting that um, there are other assumptions that sort of can affect this. 
um, because this is what is the probability that a host galaxy, a galaxy that's hosting a gravitational wave event, is in the catalogue. Um, if you make assumptions about the kinds of galaxies that are more likely to host gravitational wave events, that will impact these parameters. Uh, so, for example, if you were to luminosity weight um, your galaxies and say that more luminous galaxies are more likely to host events, then um, that would increase the probability of the host being in the catalogue by definition. So looking now at the first term, um, this is the gravitational wave likelihood when the host galaxy is inside the galaxy catalogue and if you've been wondering where the galaxy catalogue information actually enters the analysis, this is it. Um, because it will inform your redshift prior here. And then conversely, um, for the out of catalogue one, uh, we have the likelihood where the host galaxy is outside the galaxy catalogue and uh, your redshift prior becomes whatever sort of choice you have made uh, for the rest of the universe. That's back to your uniform and co-moving volume, for example. So that's a very brief introduction as to how we handle uh, gravitational wave selection effects and how we handle galaxy catalogue incompleteness. Uh, the next step is looking at what happens when you actually apply this to some mock data um, to test that it actually works. The mock data that we're looking at in particular um, consists of 250 uh, simulated binary neutron star detections, um, again sticking with an O2-like detector sensitivity. Uh, we then created a universe for them to have come from, which requires assuming some value of the Hubble constant, um, assigning, creating a host galaxy for each event essentially, um, and then also populating the universe with um, other galaxies. And then in order to create the galaxy catalogues that we need to do the analysis, uh, we then applied an apparent magnitude threshold cut uh, to the universe um, in order to uh, make the catalogue incomplete. Um, and we tried this with varying levels of incompleteness um, in order to see how well uh, we were able to deal with fairly incomplete catalogues. So this here is a GIF showing um, how the posterior on the Hubble constant changes as more events are added to the analysis. The black thick line here is the actual posterior itself and it is the product of all of the purple curves which are the contributions from individual events. Um, and you can see that it starts off relatively broad, broad uh, quickly narrows due to some relatively informative events and then as events uh, continue it slowly narrows um, around the chosen value of the constant of 70. I think interesting things to note here um, are that of the events uh, not all of them peak around 70, in fact some of them peak obviously away from the value of 70, um, but this isn't surprising actually this catalogue um, was not complete. I think this one had about 50% of the host galaxies weren't actually in the catalogue. So for each of these events you have the possibility that the host galaxy isn't actually contributing, um, but there are other galaxies within the sky area that happen to have gravitational wave support. Um, there's also the fact that the actual distance estimate that you get, you don't expect to peak at the exact true distance of the event every time. So there is a fair bit of spread. Um, but the important thing to note is that all of these events are consistent with the injected value of the Hubble constant. Um, and so when you multiply them all together, you start to hone in on it. Uh, now looking at one of the results from this paper, um, this is the posterior for 250 binary neutron star events, and in this case the galaxy catalogue um, only contained 25% of the host galaxies. Um, so I think this is just a nice demonstration that even when um, your galaxy catalogues are highly incomplete, 
uh, you can still get an unbiased result on the Hubble constant um, as long as you have correctly accounted for your EM selection effects. The only, yeah, it's just worth noting um, that it will take more events to narrow down to the same level of precision if you had a, as if you had like a higher completeness um, catalogue. So we've looked at mock data. Now what about real data? Um, looking purely at uh, observing runs one and two, um, we had one binary neutron star detection with its electromagnetic counterpart, um, which provided an already impressive constraint on the Hubble constant, followed by well, with an additional uh, 10 binary black hole detections uh, for which we have had to use galaxy catalogues to fill in the missing redshift information. Um, so the default catalog used in that case was the Glade catalog because it has full sky coverage. Um, but one of the events, um, a rather well localized one, happened to land within the footprint of the public DES Y1 catalog. Um, and so that was also used to analyze that specific event. This is a figure um, from a gravitational wave measurement of the Hubble constant following the second observing run of advanced LIGO and Virgo. Um, and what this is showing is um, that P of G term that I highlighted earlier, the probability that the host galaxy is inside the catalog given detection. Um, so essentially the gray curves here all correspond to uh, the Glade catalog. They have slightly different slopes because the apparent magnitude threshold along the line of sight of the events uh, varied slightly. But in general, the apparent magnitude threshold was around, I think, 17.8. And you can see there are three events that have reasonable probabilities of being inside the catalogue. Um, GW170814 is the one that was associated with the DES catalogue and that has much higher completeness <clears throat> because it was complete out to, um, I think, an apparent magnitude threshold of about 23, uh, which means that more or less there was about 100% probability that it was in the catalogue, which is obviously great for this kind of analysis. So looking at um, some more figures from this paper. This one on the left shows the individual contributions from the six events, the six binary black holes that ended up being selected. Um, it's six rather than ten because an SNR uh, cut was applied that was a little bit more uh, constrained than the one, than the way the events were originally um, detected, but essentially six events and you can see that uh, 170814, which has the most complete catalog, also is the most informative event that we have. Um, and it actually peaks around a Hubble constant of 70 um, due to an overdensity of galaxies in the DES catalog at the corresponding redshift. When you combine all of these events together um, and combine them with the binary neutron star, you get this figure on the right. So the Pale orange is the binary neutron star, uh, in red are the binary black holes, and the blue shows the contribution, the final posterior, um, which you can see is a slight improvement over, over the binary neutron star. It's not a massive improvement, but we're also only working with um, six additional events. Um, of which only one of them had particularly high in catalogue probability and the others were relatively uninformative. But in either case, either way, I think that this is um, an, interesting, an interesting result because it shows uh, this method in practice with the first real data. But of course, Nothing is actually as simple as I have made it sound. Um, so we'll have a quick look at the caveats, why nothing is as straightforward. Um, the first one thing I want to mention is the inhomogeneousness of um, galaxy catalogue completeness, which I think is demonstrated nicely by this um, figure from the Glade paper. 
Uh, here, colors show number density of galaxies per square degree, um, with the dark red being high density of galaxies and the blue being a low density, um, which in this case you can kind of take as a proxy for how complete the catalog is. Um, and basically you can see that there's a huge variation over the sky um, with the Milky Way band being essentially empty um, and other patches of relatively high completeness. So for the O2 Hubble constant paper, it was assumed that um, the completeness was the same within the sky area of each event. But when you have particularly large sky areas for your events, that was just blatantly not going to be true. You'll always um, cross the edges of surveys and things like that. And so this needs to be uh, handled in a more sophisticated manner. Additionally, for the more uh, in depth catalogs that we do have, the ones we go to higher higher redshifts, they tend to be photometric redshifts that we get, um, which firstly have very large uncertainties associated with them, uh, sort of ten percent, thirty percent perhaps. Um, the uncertainty itself is not a problem because that can be easily marginalized over within the sort of bounds of the of the analysis. Um, the issue sort of comes from the trustworthiness of photometric redshifts, especially as you're getting too much higher redshifts where you don't have the spectroscopic information or as much spectroscopic information um, available for making those estimates. And then it sort of comes into question how trustworthy those redshifts you're using are at all, which sort of places an overall limitation um, on potentially what can be done without better redshift estimates. There's also the redshifting of source frame luminosity. Um, everything that we detect in a galaxy catalog has been redshifted out of its source frame. But if you are choosing to say luminosity weight your host galaxies in your analysis, uh, then you will want to make a like-for-like -like comparison. So you want something nearby in B-band to be comparable to B-band at a high redshift as well, which means applying k-corrections in order to account for this. And again, uh, while this is doable, um, and especially doable relatively nearby, again, at very high redshifts, um, there could be a lot more bounds for um, uncertainty in how reliable those corrections become. So those are some of the challenges facing us with galaxy catalogs, uh, but also the gravitational wave data side of things is no more simple. Um, so one thing of note, uh, so gravitational wave selection effects are important. How you define a detection uh, varies um, for the O2 Hubble constant paper. The detection threshold was set as an SNR threshold. Um, however, in reality, uh, gravitational waves are detected based on false alarm rate, the number of false alarms that would create a similar signal sort of per year. Um, and those two are not the same thing. So however you end up selecting your gravitational wave events, perhaps you want um, only want to use the louder ones because you're more interested in signals that are closer or nearer by. Um, you also need to match the same in your gravitational wave selection effects. And this means that if you wanted to use all of the detections that you have, um, including ones that were maybe sub-threshold, um, it would require a lot of uh, work, a lot of um, in detail in order to match that selection with your selection effects, essentially. Even more importantly, perhaps, um, is this notion of the redshifting of source frame masses, which I mentioned really briefly earlier on. So when you detect a gravitational wave event, um, you get a distance estimate, you get sky information, you get mass information, but that mass information has been redshifted. Um, which means that if you want to put a prior on the mass distribution of, say, binary black holes in their source frame, 
um, you have to make some kind of assumption about cosmology in order to convert the masses you've detected um, into source frame masses. And obviously you don't want your source frame mass prior to be informed by a choice on the Hubble constant if you're aiming to measure the Hubble constant, which means that uh, in reality, you'd have to um, estimate those things jointly, estimate the cosmology alongside um, the sort of population of binary black holes, which is no mean feat, I think it can safely be said. Um, and of course, your gravitational wave selection effects are common to all of the events in a given population, so they'll be the same for all of the binary black holes you have, um, which means that there is huge potential for systematic bias if you get it wrong, because the more events you combine together, uh, the more impact um, the selection effects will have. Well, I think that covers covers that, and now we can look a little bit to the future. Um, so when will we have an answer? When will we measure the Hubble constant to high enough precision to be actually able to say something meaningful about the Hubble constant tension? I am going to cop out and say it really depends. Um, obviously, we have a lot more events now, what with um, the third observing run having finished and with future observing runs coming in the future. But the main thing which determines how quickly we will be able to constrain the Hubble constant is really not the number of detections so much as the quality of the data that we have. Um, so how well localized those events are, how nearby they are, how good the catalogue information is. And luckily the prospects for all of these things are improving in the near future. Um, so later this decade, there will be more gravitational wave detectors coming online, which means we will have better localized gravitational wave events. Uh, this is better not just for the um, statistical galaxy catalog method, um, but it's also better for the EM counterpart method because it means we'll have smaller sky areas that need to be searched in order to find these counterparts. Additionally, there'll be deeper galaxy surveys becoming available, uh, which means we can have more informative contributions from individual events. And hopefully some of these galaxy surveys will have uh, more spectroscopic measurements of redshift. Um, so we'll have more precise redshift measurements, which again uh, will increase the information that we can get from events at higher distances. I think it's safe to say that this field is, while it's still young, it is a very interesting place to be um, at this time. And it's worth keeping an eye on over the next few years, as I think some fairly interesting things will probably happen. And that's all I really wanted to say. So I just want to say thank you all for listening to me. Um, and if you do have any questions about anything that I've said, please do send them my way. Thank you very much.